So this is lecture 12 of ECE 5312. And so what happens is we've had a good time with lecture 11 looking at Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. We looked at lecture 10 and how we can take the, weight, the, the signaling modulation and schemes that we use in, in terms of waveform space and vectorize them. Come up with a way of representing analog waveforms in terms of vectors. This will serve as a premise for doing our optimal receiver derivation. So I remember what I said about this course. And I think most of you that came to see me about the course project, I emphasize very much that you, we should stay on task with respect to the content of this course serving as the purpose of, you know, as sort of focus of the projects, which is quantitative performance analysis of digital communication systems. This is not a coding course. This is not a signal estimation detection course. You can use those concepts to help you out, but this is really a digital comms performance analysis course. Now, in order to do performance analysis accurately, you, you're going to have to send signals over a channel. So what I have drawn here is the typical transmitter channel receiver diagram. Beautiful. And I represented it in terms of waveforms, right? There is a source. It is digital. M, I, of T are the signals that are coming out of that source. The modulator converts it into a waveform. It is sent over the channel. Noise is added to it, additive white Gaussian noise. And then the receiver picks it up. And we want, OK, so this is always an interesting question. As an engineer, what do we have control over? The channel? No. Absolutely not. Oh, I would love that. Like, you know, oh, I think it's just too noisy in here. You know, and all the noise goes down. No, I wish that's the case, but no. A uh, transmitter, maybe, but most likely not. As a, I forgot who I was talking with earlier today. There was a student, and I was talking with him, and I said, you know how wireless communication standards are written? They're always written from the perspective of the transmitter. They give you all the specs of the transmitter. It is up to you to come up with a good receiver, right? It's the total opposite if you deal with speech coding. Speech coding, all the details about what the receiver, like the decoder, speech decoder, are given, you're, it's up to you to come up with a good speech encoder, right? So exact opposite. So in this case, we probably don't have any choice on the transmitter. This is the format. Live with it. As we'll see in the next lecture, we, our only place where we can do anything in this course, in terms of design, is the receiver. And optimal, oh, I hate that word optimal when it's used out of context. The number of papers I've read and number of presentations, especially PhD dissertations that I've attended or watched, where it's like, oh, and this solutions is the optimal. And I said, so where's the math? Oh, well, it's optimal as it gives the best possible solution. Prove it, you know. I'm going to prove it to you, folks. I'm going to prove that I can come up with an optimal receiver, OK? If you ever want to find a word that says best possible receiver or really good receiver, then use really good receiver, best possible receiver, or whatever. Optimal, you know, faux pas. Don't, don't say optimal unless you really can back it up. Now, waveforms. R of t is equal to S i of t plus n of t, right? Transmitted signal, noise, yeah, that's exactly how it works in real life, right? This, I'm adding noise to it, and then it uh, gets received. But what, conceptually, what does this mean? My receiver only sees this. It only sees R of t. It does not see. SIFT. SIFT is hidden behind the noise. We've got to make a decision. Sometimes the signal is very easy. It's like, oh, yeah, there it is. It's just a little bit corrupted. Other times, oh, I can't see anything. The Look at it. The vector model is so straightforward. The vector R is equal to the vector SI plus the vector N. So how does this look like? Why do we have that? So. So how did I get that? So we can write, remember those basis functions? 
So what we can do is we can say, okay, we can have R of K, 5K, T, right? We can have SI of T is equal to summation across K of SI, K, phi K of T. And then we have the noise, which is equal to NK, phi K of T, which therefore we can get R, the vector. So a little bar underneath usually denotes vector. Some people put it on top of a little arrow thing, you, you know. And so here, that's my shorthand. That's R1, R2, R2D2. And let's say it's M space. And then we have SI, the vector. SI1, SI2, do, 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 do. and then N, the vector. N1, N2, right? So we vectorized it. So what happens is when I have, and let's say we do transpose. So that means R is equal to SI plus N is equal to R1, R2, let's say it's M dimensional space, is equal to SI1, SI2, SIM plus a noise vector. Now, what's interesting is, how does this look like graphically in the vector space? So let's say this is two-dimensional space, because I don't know how to draw anything beyond three-dimensional space. And even three-dimensional is very tricky for my rudimentary drawing skills. What happens is, let's say this is two-dimensional space. Use a different color. Okay? So let's say it's 2D space. And suppose that I have this is what S one, the vector looks like. And then I have noise, right? Noise is added to this. <gasps> vector addition. Mm. And so what this creates at the end of the day is this new vector called R. So what I've just done is I've illustrated how Noise, the addition of noise to a signal looks like in the vector space. All this is vector addition. It's the displacement of the vector head by some amount n from the original transmitted vector. It's even cooler than that. Oh my god, it's so much cooler. Because w what about n? So this lecture, this lecture, what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and characterize this vector n. So we know that N of T is Gaussian. It's AWGN. It's additive, which we already know. It's white, which means it's uncorrelated, sample by sample by sample by sample. And it's Gaussian, which means it has a bell curve distribution. But what about N, the vector? What type of distribution does that have? What's its, what's its variance? And better yet, how does a vector of and look like in space. And so here's the thing. I, wanna, I really do want to draw this because it's just so cool. Okay. So let's, let's redraw this. So let's say here's your two-dimensional space, right? And suppose that's your vector, S1. And suppose your noise is acting in the plane, right? And then here's your R, right? So that's exactly what I drew before, right? So everyone got that? I'm just drawing it at a slant. Now, this is actually really cool stuff. Check this out. So how does that noise look like? It's, it's random, right? So it just happened this time, the vector is shooting out that way with that intensity. The next time instant, that same vector might be this way, in that, in that plane, or in this way or in this way, or this way. Let's say that was a bad one, right? And this one. It turns out that that n vector is also Gaussian. Its elements are Gaussian. Those elements represent sort of the x, y coordinates, right? And, it's, and because it's white, it's uncorrelated, it's independent in those dimensions. What does it produce? Oh, you know what I'm going to draw.
draws a Gaussian. What happens is, imagine if you will, I'm dumping a Gaussian. In this case, it's two-dimensional, PDF, boop, on the head of S1. And what that tells me is, statistically, that noise can displace the head in any one of those directions with that problem. Beautiful. The question is now, how do I know this? So I, what I did is I just basically told you the punchline of the joke, and now I'm going to tell you the joke, so it's not going to be as funny. But I'm so excited to tell you this. But I mean, isn't this cool? What happens is, by realizing this in the vector domain, what this Gaussian curve tells you is the height. The height of that Gaussian uh, PDF tells you with what probability you're going to have a Gaussian vector. That's right, that noise vector. Let me get it. Let me draw it in black. So the height here, this says, like, if zero mean, it's very likely we might displace the head of that transmitted vector by a small amount, and that the more progressively we go out, move away from S1, the head of the vector, the less likely is it to occur. But it's not impossible, because Gaussians go from minus infinity to infinity in both dimensions, right? Ah, yes. Now. It's kind of cool, because when we talk about noise, right, and we talk about noise power, it usually comes back to variance. How does variance look like in this case? It's how wide that curve is. So, so you can have, like, if you have very little variance in terms of noise, you're going to have almost like a pencil of a bell curve. And then on the other hand, if you have very wide variance, lots of energy spread all over the place, high likelihood of great displacement, then that's not so good, because then we get into problems. And this, you must keep this image, all of you, in your heads, because this is going to come up later on when we make decisions on what happens when we get an error. Oh, this is going to come back. But right now, all of you are saying, nah, I don't believe you. I, th I, I don't believe you that it's actually Gaussian. I don't believe that N of T can translate into a bunch of other Gaussians. Ah, so I'm going to prove all of you, that this is the case. <laughs> and to imagine that I, the last time I had coffee today was at 6 o'clock this morning. So the caffeine's finally beginning to wear away. So what ends up happening is, OK, this is old news. We can represent each waveform in terms of these orthonormal basis functions. Yay. Now, oh. So this angle bracket is different than, oh my god, yeah, here's a class of notation. This angle bracket is different than the other angle brackets that we saw in lecture 8. This is not the average across all AI and BI values. This here is another way of representing dot product. If there could be any other ways of representing dot product. So you can put a little dot between two vectors, or you can say, That's another way of doing it. So if you see this notation, I'm not doing the average over this guy and this guy. I'm doing the dot product, right? It's the projection. OK. So now I do the same thing on the other two vectors. Now the punchline is coming up really quickly. So we present the received vector the transmit vector, the noise vector, in terms of all those vector coefficients and such. So we need the PDF. And I already told you that n, the vector, is a joint Gaussian PDF. And it's uncorrelated. So what's going to happen is, how do we get that? How do we know? And the answer is staring at us in the face. So how do we get nk? How do we get each element? So let me write this on the board, the whiteboard. You know, it feels great not to write in chalk. <laughs> Especially it goes on your clothes and stuff. So, so remember, yeah. so n of k. So let's say the kth element. Remember how we do that? We project n of t onto the kth basis function, dt, right? This here guy is Gaussian. Everyone see that? Now, what's interesting is so this is a random variable. We're multiplying it 
against a deterministic constant. Not, sorry, deterministic function. And then we're integrating from 0 to t. That's also Gaussian. So what happens when you have a Gaussian random variable multiplied by, in this case, some waveform, and then we integrate it from 0 to t? What does it produce? Gaussian, right? Because we have something, so we might, but here's the thing. Do we have the same mean? I don't know. We may or may not. Do we have the same variance? I don't know. We may or may not. We have to derive these now. So we know that this guy, we have a Gaussian random variable multiplied by a deterministic function, and we integrate it. And this, what happens is when you integrate, you're basically taking this deterministic waveform that's multiplied by Gaussian, and you're sort of summing all these points, which will then, by central limit theorem, produce a Gaussian constant, but the mean and variance may not be equal to what the original nt is. Yes? So even if n of t is not Gaussian, we will get Gaussian all the time. So the question is, if n, if n of t is what, not Gaussian? It's, random pro, uh, it's not Gaussian. Any n is t. You're still getting Gaussian. So th that's the thing. So central limit theorem, if you use it in the sort of the strict sense of what happens is if we have enough random variables, under certain conditions, we would get a Gaussian, right? But in this case, what happens is, like just focusing specifically on just Gaussian random variables, because we, if we deal with other ones, the math, we have to make sure that we sum enough in order to get that. If we don't, eh. But here, what happens when you take a Gaussian and you multiply by a deterministic waveform integrator right across, you still get a Gaussian. The integral of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. The Gaussian times a, a deterministic function will still be a Gaussian. is not a Gaussian, then it becomes a little trickier. You have to do a little bit. I would, I, like, so what type of noise would we have? What's a good noise? I'm trying to think. Mm. I'll come up with one afterward. But, but, but in essence, yes. Like, but I think for now, let's focus on Gaussian, right? OK. So now what happens is, just like, the thing is, ah. so what we do is we go through this crazy math map. These little vector. So the, what we want to do is two things. So I mentioned them already. Of the vector, and we need to find what the correlation is, right? Actually, it will be a it, it should have like on the main diagonal its variance of of each element. And then, you, it, depending on whether it's correlated or not, and what's going to happen is there's going to be a little bit of a surprise here. What happens is it's white, right? Uncorrelated, which means independent, which means that each one of the dimensions are independent of each other. And that's why we have that beautiful symmetric shape of a PDF. So the first question is, what, like, you know, the mean of this vector is equal to 0. And you say, why? Yeah. Why is it? I am multiplying it against a deterministic function, and I'm integrating it. Should it be mean of 0 still? Yes. Why? Take the expectation of, let's say, an element of that guy, right? So take the expectation. Why am I doing that? Let's do that here. I, instead of talking with my hands, I should be talking with the board. Oh, yes. So what happens is, so we know that n of k is equal to 0 to t, n of t, right? Ah, oh, no, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, phi k, right? And so now, if we want to find out, OK, what can I do? We can bring ek inside. Why? Because it's linear. This guy 
and this guy are both linear operators. So I can interchange, I can switch them around. So now I have this guy operating on n of t. Now, this guy is deterministic, right? My expectation won't care about him. Ah, and we know that this is zero mean Gaussian. Zoop. Zero. So that is equal to zero. And each one of those elements will form a zero vector. Okay. This is good. This is good. Everyone with me? More or less? Okay. I know it's late. It's only 10.35, either AM or PM. We still don't know. <sighs> I need to get new batteries for that watch. So, second guy. This is so this is going to get into a little bit of that gory mathematics that I was telling you guys about to brace yourselves for. So with this guy here, what we're going to do is let's say we find out, instead of calculating what the correlation matrix is, what we're going to do instead is let's look at one element and try and develop a pattern. Right? So in this case, take element K and element L of the noise vector that's applied with itself transpose. And what happens is we have the, 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 the KL element of this matrix, and we take the expectation of him, and it actually yields something very interesting. So I'm going to work this out, because I think everyone would, instead of just like hand-waving, I'd rather just draw it. So let's say we take the expectation of NK and L. That's going to be equal to the expectation right, of integral from 0 to t, nt, phi kt, dt, and 0 to t, n tau, phi l tau, d tau. And there's a reason why I'm using two different time indices. It's going to get kind of confusing in a few minutes. Okay? So what's going to happen is, let's bring this all together. Come together. <laughs> Sorry, Beatles. So, uh, think Alex. 0 to t, 0 to t, n t, n tau, phi k t, phi l tau, d t, d tau. So everyone sees what I'm doing, right? Super boring? Absolutely. Okay? Now, ah, what do we do now? So what we do is, just like before, we bring the expectation operator to the inside. So if we do that, and then the expectation, again, the only thing that's random is these guys. And then we have phi k t, phi l tau, d t, d tau. Now, here's the interesting thing. What is this guy equal to? Mumble, mumble, mumble. What? what? <laughs> Please tell me. I can't hear. I'm, I'm deaf. It must be all that chainsawing. What? Radius? Radius? Variance, yes. Variance? Everyone? Variance? You sure? Okay. So what happens is yes. So this gives you the variance. But again, what what we have additive white Gaussian noise. So there's a specific thing about this. What happens if tau and t are not equal? Two different time instances. Uncorrelated, right? So what happens is this forces us now, this guy here, we have to have t equal to tau. Otherwise, it's 0. So, ah, I shouldn't use red. So what happens is we have this guy. So what we do is we let t equal tau, and that should give us the variance otherwise, right? And 
we have phi k of t, phi l of t, and then dt. This is a constant. We can take it out. What is this guy equal to? This, the only time this will work is if k is equal to l. Otherwise, it's 0. Right? So what happens is, in the end of the day, if we do this, this derivation, and hopefully I didn't mess up. <laughs> so yes. Ah, yes. Yeah, so I did. OK. So through, we have this guy here, this mess. And if we work through this, we have a delta Dirac function, t minus rho. In this case, I used tau instead of rho. Bad me. Now, what happens is I plug that in. What's the next thing? Oh, these two guys. Ah, oh, yeah. This is only non-zero if L is equal to function. We have this delta. So at the end of the day, what do we want? So if we go back to this guy here. This guy, in order for him to, we can write it in a simple equation. So you might notice there was an n naught over 2 power spectral density is equal to sigma squared, the variance of the Gaussian. And it's equal to delta k minus L. How does this look like in terms of a matrix E, N, N transpose? It's going to look like this. And 0 for the upper and lower triangular halves. Right? How can you make math any more fun? <sighs> With colors, right? So, OK. So now what I've done, w so why, why am I making this point so important? It's because what we've just done is I sh I've shown all of you how you can take a time domain waveform noise and con convert it into a random vector with its statistical characteristics totally no. <sighs> Very good. Now, there's a few notes. Uh, yep. I have a question. Yeah, yeah. This shows that NK and NL are uncorrelated. Yes. But not in the so the question is this shows that they're un uh, NK and NL are uncorrelated but not independent. Now, the answer is what happens when they're Gaussian? Uncorrelatedness equals independence. It's the only random variable that achieves that. That's an excellent point. So if, let's say, we had Cauchy. <gasps> ah, so there's a noise. There's a noise we can do over the channel. So we were, before, the previous question, which was, suppose that n of t was not Gaussian, would this still yield a Gaussian? Well, let, one way to try out for exercise for a student, what happens if we have Cauchy distributed noise? So, Alexi, please solve that and show me tomorrow, OK? <laughs> no, just kidding. So what happens is their uncorrelatedness is not independent. The only random variable that achieves that is Gaussian. So that's an excellent point, Mustafa. That's excellent. <laughs> so where am I? Where am I? Which planet am I on? Oh. In fact, that's what the next slide does. Ah! The Gaussian case is the only known one where uncorrelatedness is independent. This is, so that's really important because what happens is if I have a two-dimensional Gaussian, what does that mean? The way the Gaussian interacts, the PDF in one direction, one dimension, is totally independent of the other one. That's why I have that smooth dome-like shape in all directions. If they were correlated, it would be this weird sort of molded thing that would not be perfectly symmetric, right? So that's the thing. That's the beautiful, that's the first note. OK. And so there's, and then there's that recall, like, you know, the central limit theorem. And so that's, that's the other point, Masafa, that you were pointing out earlier about the outputs of random variables. If they have characteristics. So if we sum a gajillion Cauchy's, central limit theorem says Gaussian, or any such thing, right? Uniform, 
Not sure about Rayleigh. I think there are some constraints on which sort of random variables you can use, but it's beautiful, right? Yeah. OK. So how does this PDF look like? In fact, this is quite critical. So that the, the question about uncorrelatedness, does that imply independence? For Gaussians, absolutely yes. And this is where it's going to come up. So the PDF, so this is little p, but it's really big, about one foot tall on the screen there, of n, right, is the joint PDF of the Gaussian element n1, n2, nm, right? So a two-dimensional Gaussian PDF, a joint PDF, looks like this. Right? Yeah. Now, what happens is, yeah. what happens is, in the, by independence, I can take that PDF. and consider them piecemeal. Right? So, and we all know what an individual Gaussian PDF looks like. Right? Assuming all the variances are the same, so it's IID, independently and identically distributed. ID. Minus the mean of ni, but it would be n squared divided by 2 sigma squared. So what happens is this actually yields something very nice. So if we do the mathematics, what do we end up getting? What happens is p n of n, so the vector n n is going to be equal to the product of the individual PDFs from i equals 1 to m. Now, they all have the same common base, which is an exponent. And they also have that thing in the front that's all identical. So that's going to be equal to uh, blah, 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 2 pi m over 2 sigma Sigma 2m? Yeah. That's weird. Yep. No, no. Mm. Uh, yep. My boo boo. Oh, I love this. Way better than chalk. So what happens is that's equal to m. Otherwise, you guys are going to be way off by a little bit. Then, common exponent. And so what's the product of an exponential? It's going to be a sum inside. So that's going to be equal to summation of i equals 1 to m of minus, what is it, n i minus mu n squared 2 sigma squared, right? And what does this look like vector-wise? I'm just going to redraw it. This guy is equal to minus Sorry, ah. n the vector minus, if we had a mean of n the vector, squared divided by 2 sigma squared. What I've just done is I've vectorized a PDF. Ha! Isn't that amazing? Something to write home about. So, if we do that, this is. We can also express this guy, okay? NK, okay? What we're going to see in the next lecture is 
this guy, if we use conditional probability of the received and transmit vectors, we can characterize it by this n-dimensional Gaussian probability. And what happens when we have probabilities? We can then do analyses, like what is the probability that will incorrectly decode one symbol as another? And it's all characterized by this Gaussian noise vector. All right? So, so for that, like what we're going to need to do is we are going to need this lecture's materials in order to accomplish that. All right. So that concludes um, lecture 12. Okay. So what I've done, so, that, so now we're off camera, so now everyone